The need for better medicine frequently arises from war since the times of antiquity. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, once said that one who wishes to be a surgeon should go to war, and his words ring true even in modern times. The Great War of 1914 to 1918 is one of the most crucial periods of recent human history for advancement in both weapon development and advancement in medicine. Welcome to Nutty History, and today let's find out how the First World War changed medicine for good. In 1914, an elimination of a prince spiraled into a chain of events that led to the inevitable war, and history witnessed the horrors of warfare like never before. For the first time, the world saw over 30 nations declare war, using all available resources and prioritizing warfare over non-combatant needs. There was no limit on the type of weapons used, and more innovations in terms of biological, chemical, and other weapons were all imminent. Death and decay ran rampant across Europe and many other parts of the world as the war for imperial supremacy raged on. Infirmaries and medical camps, too, experienced war in an unfamiliar fashion, this time despite being tethered to each other for centuries. The challenges posed by this war for medicine were like strangers encountering each other for the first time. With most of the fighting set in the trenches of Europe and with the unexpected length of the war, Soldiers were often malnourished, exposed to all weather conditions, sleep deprived, and often knee deep in the mud along with the bodies of men and animals prone to all kinds of diseases. War casualties increased significantly due to the armament race between enemy countries. In the wake of the mass slaughter, it became clear that the only way to cope with the sheer number of casualties was to have an efficient administrative system that identified and prioritized injuries as they arrived. This was the birth of the triage system. The triage system was a means to classify wounds and injuries endured on the battlefield into three broad categories, trivial, treatable, and terrible. Keeping soldiers at the front line was a huge priority, so those with minor or trivial wounds were treated first, and the aim was to send them back to the battlefield with a quick patch up as soon as possible. Those who had severe but treatable injuries and wounds were next in line. The terrible category included those who had grave wounds and were less likely to make it out of the infirmary to join the battle again. It does sound apathetic to a degree, but the triage system helped to bring order and efficiency to urgent medical care, and after the First World War, the system was established as standard practice in military medicine. The triage system also played a vital role in regulating the spread of trench foot or immersion foot syndrome, a terrible gift of the First World War to humanity. Trench foot was a direct consequence of trench construction. Dug in land near or at sea level left the men standing, eating, and sleeping in puddles of water. The symptoms included swelling, numbness, and discoloration of the feet. By the end of the war, a total of 74,000 Allied troops are believed to have suffered from the condition. Until then, amputation was a common practice in military medicine to reduce the chances of death by gangrene. But thanks to the triage system, trench feet were treated as soon as possible by cleaning and drying feet as often as possible and also by changing socks. Other methods involve rubbing whale oil into their feet and even a stamping drill of stomping and rubbing their feet in unison to get the blood flow going. Soldiers also tried digging drainage ditches and laying duckboards through communication trenches to avoid flooding. But it is also true that the triage system, though effective, could only do so much. The poor sanitary conditions in trenches led to infections, infections led to indomitable pressure on the triage system, and the indomitable pressure caused the delay in treatment of medical practices such as amputations to prevent gangrene. As a consequence of the infection epidemic, there was a crying need for the improvements of antisepsis. French surgeon Alex Carrel and English chemist Henry Drysdale Dakin saved the day by developing the Carrel Dakin chlorine based antiseptic effective in disinfecting traumatic wounds. The Carrel Dakin method of verdinization involved opening the wounds to thoroughly irrigate them with a sodium hypochlorite solution. This was instilled by means of small rubber tubes closed at the end and perforated with six to eight holes at half inch intervals. Now, while the method may have come about in time, the war necessitated rapid developments in medicine and medical practice. It allowed doctors to work on a large scale of patients all suffering from the same disease. Antivenin, a fascinating and marvelous invention of the early 20th century, also heroically helped save men against contagious diseases that were common to spread in stuffed and unhygienic trenches. 
France, ever so wisely, made the typhoid anti-venin obligatory for its entire army on March 28, 1914. The war proved them correct, as within the first 14 months of the war, more than 100,000 cases of typhoid fever were declared and the mortality rate due to fever was as high as 20%. University of Toronto Antitoxin Laboratories, later renamed Conant Laboratories, developed antivenin for tetanus for Canadian troops. Germany made sure to get their troops on the Russian front the antivenin against cholera as well. The U.S. Army's intervention in the war proved the most pivotal in advancing the process of blood transfusions. It delivered more physicians to the front lines with broader knowledge, especially English-born medical science Oswald Hope Robertson. When deployed to the front lines in France, Robertson developed plans for what would become the first blood bank. Previously, all blood stored near the front lines was at risk of clotting. By implementing anticoagulant methods, such as adding citrate or using paraffin inside the storage vessel, he made the blood preservable for 26 days. Robertson also used transportation via ammunition boxes packed with sawdust and ice, meaning that blood could be transported faster to be used on the front line. These processes were adopted throughout the war, as soldiers were issued standardized transfusion kits, allowing the procedure to occur before reaching a casualty clearing station. This was a huge advancement because at this age, injured men on the battlefield were still being transported by cattle car to the nearest city. The whole process of blood transfusion was archaic as well. The original process of blood transfusions relied on both the donor and patient lying next to each other, with both blood vessels exposed, connected by rubber tubing. This led to many complications, such as clotting, patient self-restraint, and inability to measure how much blood was passing between the two individuals. While it was not an innovation of war, thanks to Oswald Hope Robertson, the process of blood transfusion was greatly refined during World War I. Consequently, the First World War introduced transfusion methods to more doctors and in more standardized procedures than might have occurred in peacetime and convinced them of its benefits. After the war, these results and practices were promoted to a new status in civilian medical practice. In surgery, the anesthetic process was in dire need of an overhaul when the First World War commenced and much effort was expended on this particular field during the war. Thanks to the development of less toxic morphine-derived anesthetic agents, surgeries became more reliable. More importantly, the development of new devices such as the CAMU and Aubridon ether inhalers facilitated the process of anesthesia. This allowed surgeons to perform operations that were considered impossible. Emergency surgery made spectacular progress during the war with the systematic use of preemptive suturing. It avoided the need for immediate amputation, much practice in past wars. It also enabled quick laparotomies to save soldiers with abdominal wounds. Reconstructive surgeries also advanced as they became more and more important during the war. Before the First World War, plastic surgery was in practice as a specialism like it is being done today. Usually, work was undertaken by whichever surgeon received the case. But from the Battle of the Somme onwards, there was a huge rise in facial mutilations and as a result, a separate medical field was developed focusing on treating such injuries. Thanks to improvements in asepsis and again general anesthetic, the risk of life in reconstructive surgeries was substantially reduced as well. A New Zealand-born surgeon, Harold Gillies, and Auguste Charles Valadier, a French-American dentist, came together in France to tackle the challenge of helping the large number of soldiers whose faces were mutilated in trench warfare. Gillies focused hard on the anesthetic part of the surgery. He also wanted to help patients regain their original physical features as much as possible. With his work, Gillies became famous for his use of the tube pedicle technique, in which he would only partially remove tissue from its original site so it retained a blood supply during transfer to another site. This practice reduced the risk of infection to a great degree and allowed large quantities of still living skin to be transferred from one section of the body to another. Parallel to the progress in reconstructive surgery were improvements in prosthetic devices. Now, when the war broke out, the making of prosthetic limbs was a small industry. Thomas Splint was a revolutionary invention by Hugh Owen Thomas in orthopedics, reducing death by broken thigh bones by 80%. Yet injuries from new weapons were still causing a lot of men to return home with physical disabilities. Production of artificial limbs had to increase dramatically, and there was also the need for improving designs and techniques 
so these unfortunate souls can still live a life as close to normal as possible. One of the ways this was achieved was by employing men who had amputations to make prosthetic limbs. They learned the trade alongside established tradespeople. Not only did it help them to give their input as being on-site target customers, but it also helped them to make a living because of their disabilities, as it wasn't easy for them to find work elsewhere. Soon, not only replacements for amputated limbs such as legs, arms, and hands were being manufactured at the war level, extremities such as facial disfigurement where surgery had its limits were also being aided with prosthesis such as nasal and ocular necessities. In addition, a number of devices to accelerate rehabilitation were invented during the war. Among these was a mouth opener that promoted the recovery of muscle elasticity in jaw injuries, a strapped-on mouth guard that supported or replaced jaw bones, and the Darsisac helmet that immobilized the face for the treatment of fractures. No other medical term is often associated with the First World War as shell shock. Previously, any individual showing symptoms of neurosis was immediately sent to an asylum and consequently forgotten. As World War I made its debut, it brought forward a new type of warfare that no one was prepared for. With the introduction of new weapons, a new psychiatric disorder came to light known as shell shock. Coined in 1915 by Charles Myers, shell shock was a direct catalyst for psychological medical advancement in war as it provided hundreds of test subjects in which these symptoms could be seen. Close-range bombings, lack of sleep, malnutrition, and emotional distress from witnessing mass death caused physical and mental damage lasting a lifetime. At first, the severity of the situation was handled poorly by the authorities because the assumed soldiers were malingering. Many soldiers would face death for their incompatibility to follow orders when these men were just struggling with severe mental issues. Stanley Kubrick's Path of Glory is a phenomenal representation of negligence towards shell shock in Army culture during the First World War. That is why, in direct relation, progress in neuropsychiatry was made, notably through the work of American psychiatrist Thomas William Salmon. Salmon pressed for the immediate treatment of shell shock in soldiers and the maintenance of psychiatric units close to the front. While authorities were still pressing to keep these men at the front at all costs, while simultaneously labeling them fakers, the doctors divided shell-shocked affected soldiers into two broad categories. Those suffering from shell shock were deemed capable of returning to combat after a period of rest and, in some cases, treatment, and those who were considered irreparably insane. Unfortunately, the latter became the guinea pigs of a new science of the soul, psychiatry. However, their sacrifice was not in vain as mental health issues were recognized and accepted in militaries across the world after the First World War. Also, hypnosis, electroshock therapy, and many other practices learned from the conflict were carried out in the post-war era and shaped psychiatric care as we know it today. One may say the introduction of modern warfare in the First World War paved the path for modern medical advancement, but you have to ask yourself, was the cost worth it? Does medicine really need war to progress? Tell us in the comments what you think. And as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.